your pastor liked this. Now his mama, this is my mama now. Uh, my mama's gone. I told him yesterday I know where he's at. And uh, Doris's mama was my mama too. That's what I called her, mama too. And uh, I was honored to help preach her funeral. She preached the funeral while she's here, but she she allowed me to say a few words. And uh, but I, I found the perfect preacher has been found, and he's sitting right over here. He said after hundreds of years, a model preacher has been found to suit everyone. <clears throat> you know, he wasn't a Baptist then. He preaches exactly twenty minutes and sits down. He condemns sin, but never hurts anybody's feelings. He works from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. at every type of work, from preaching to custodial service. He makes $60 a week, wears good clothes, buys good books regularly, has a nice family, drives a good car, and gives $30 a week to the church. He also stands ready to contribu contribute to every good work that comes along. He's 26 years old and has been preaching for 30 years. He is tall, short, thin, heavy set, and handsome. He has one brown eye and one blue. His hair is parted in the middle, Left side dark and straight, right side brown and wavy. He has a burning desire to work with teenagers and spend all his time with old folks. He smiles all the time with a straight face because he has a sense of humor that keeps him seriously dedicated to his work. He makes 15 calls a day on church members, spends all his time evangelizing the unchurched, and is never out of the office. That's a perfect preacher. And if you find one, let me know. I like it. I, like, I find stuff like that. I like to read them. I, I don't know why anybody, anybody don't have a whole lot to do if they can sit down and think of stuff like that to write. But anyway, uh, I'm going to read one verse of Scripture. Does that encourage you? I wouldn't get too encouraged on the shortness of it. That's, uh, if I'm buying it, I think it's still in the Bible. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, I mean 2, verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 4. And I will try to hurry. I'll just hit the top of this. See, uh, I'm going to talk about salvation. And we honor the Lord's Supper, but it's for saved folks. With, uh, with, if you got unconfessed sin, please don't take I still believe people get sick and die because they've taken the Lord's Supper because of unconfessed sin. I believe the Bible teaches that. So if you've got unconfessed sin, don't plan on confessing it. If you've got time, please, I beg you, but for your sake, don't take the Lord's Supper. It has no, it don't save you. It'll save you a lot of trouble if you'll fess up. Amen. But the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. You understand that he's, put, he's allowed me to give out the gospel? I don't understand it. I know how sorry I am. And uh, I talked to a man this week, and he's talking about somebody else. And this fellow had been in Vietnam, and he is relating some of his experiences about, you know, things that happened in wartime. And he can't get past it in his mind. Uh, he said he was saved at one time, but it, when he's 12 years old, but he wasn't saved no more. But you have to understand his background, how he was, he was taught that way, that you could lose it. And the things that he had to do in Vietnam, I think, is his biggest hang-up now. But I, I, I didn't go through those things. I was in during Vietnam, but I trained troops instead of going over there. But if you've been in wartime, it works on your mind. If you talk to uh, veterans that's been in wartime, they have a battle in their minds over things that happened they had no control over, but it still bothers them, even after they've been saved for a long time. So, uh, but that word allowed, it means to approve, have pleasure, special permission. Do you understand? What God has allowed us to do to spread the gospel, he's in charged us. That's not a suggestion. He's charged us to get the, go the gospel. 
God's word to a lost and a dying world. He said, well, I don't have anything to do. Well, let me ask you this. Everybody on your street saved? Everybody on your road saved? Well, I can't do much. Just knock on the door and ask them if they say, Amen. Give them a gospel track or something. We can all find something to do. I can't get around like I used to. I was working in the garden the other day, and I told my wife, I said, I didn't get finished, but my body did. <laughs> Amen. I can't do what I used to do. My body got finished. So I quit and went back the next day. And it got finished that day, too, before I got through. But, you know, my body's just not what it used to be. It didn't used to bother me to work all day and all night, but I can't do that anymore. And time's getting short. And if I'm going to get the gospel out, I need to do it now. Amen. I need to do it now. I heard Brother Brian say something about missions and the word now. So when are we going to get to now, getting the gospel out? Yeah. But that word trust, it means to confide in, to have faith, to commit, reliance, to expect. God expects us. To get the gospel out. To anticipate. Confidence. So, uh, and I'm going to read this also. I, I like a little saying, this is broken things. And I ain't even seen this in a while. So, sitting over a while ago, and I, and I feel like I ought to read it. God is building his kingdom with earth broken things. Men want only the strong, the successful, the victorious, the unbroken in building their kingdoms. But God is the God of the unsuccessful. Amen. Of those who have failed, heaven is filling up with earth's broken lives. There is no bruised reed that Christ cannot take and restore to the glorious blessedness and beauty he can take. The life crushed by pain and sorrow and make it into a heart whose music shall be all praise. He can lift earth's saddest failure up to heaven's glory. Now, how many of us have stand up and said, oh, I'm a great success as a Christian? I can't say that. I'm a broken thing. I heard Brother Eddie Davis preach not long ago, and he'll never know. I don't remember all he preached about. But he's talking about they take those reeds and make staffs out of them for the shepherds. And you know how they do it? He said, a lot of them, you reach out there and grab something. But he said they take a bruised reed. One with holes in it, not much count. They said they keep cutting it down. So you keep down about that long to make a flute out of it, to make music to those that need music. And boy, I, I sat and told him after church with tears in my eye, Brother, you pegged me. Brother Gary, I can't go around like your son with that long staff like he does. I can't do that. I can't go around like my brother does. It's just not in me to do what he, he's an easy, headed home today, been over two weeks or 16 days or something. I can't do that. I take my little flute. Tell somebody about Jesus. Encourages. The best ministry I know is talk to elderly folk. I've been able to go see Bernice and Jean, his mom and daddy, about once a week and just sit down and talk to them. And what a joy it is to me. But they seem to enjoy it too. There's others in the community. I've been trying to visit the elderly folks. Hey, it ain't but two or three years, somebody will be coming visiting me, I hope. <laughs> you reap what you sow, amen. But I just want to be a little flute, play a little music. And I never ever got over what I found when Mama too. A honeybee in his whole lifespan gathers about a teaspoonful of honey in the whole his whole life. A teaspoon. That's not much, is it? When you take an eighty pound beehive, that's what they say to them. Super's got about an average of about eighty pound. A lot of people working together. We have to work together. A lot of bees working together to get that eighty pound super full. Amen. But a teaspoon, that's not much. That bee gives his life. To get in that little teaspoon that we might enjoy. Amen. Amen. So let's just be a honeybee playing our flute, encourage people along the way. That's the reason I mean I'm not I'm not in this world to run people down. Well, I look at my life. I don't want nobody reminding me of everything I've always done either. Amen. Amen. I want somebody to encourage me. And I'm gonna try to encourage, and I'll try to run through this. It won't take last time I preached it and it take but an hour and fifteen minutes. But uh, I'll try to 
hurry. But the Greek and Hebrew word, and I wouldn't know it if I say it, I just know this because somebody translated it for me. I wouldn't, I don't know Greek and Hebrew. Brother Harold Ray said I knew a Greek and Hebrew one had a, what was it, hot dog stand, one had a hamburger joint, one had a restaurant or something, but that's all the Greek and Hebrew I know. But I know I've got a few book or two that tells me some things. He said it, salvation implies the ideas of deliverance, healing, safety, preservation, and soundness. Salvation is the great inclusive word of the gospel gathering into itself all the redemptive acts and processes, justification, grace, redemption, forgiveness, propitiation, imputation, sanctification, and glorification. Do you know I had no idea what those words meant when I got saved? Or as I was at Brown's Chapel, an 11-year-old boy, as barefooted as I could be, with a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt on in Bible school. I don't know what the preacher preached on, but I got saved that day. Amen. Didn't have no dime in my pocket, and didn't have a penny in my pocket. Hey, man. But God, come all the way up here to Rims Creek, just spoke to my heart. And I got saved. I didn't get to the altar to get saved. People, oh, I went to the altar and begged for an hour. I didn't. It's not how long you pray, what you pray. It's when your will gives in to God's will for salvation. No matter where you're at. I know people's got saved here and there and everywhere, but I got saved before I ever left that pew because when I made that, my will broke to his will, I said, I come to the altar, but I saved before I got there. And the old church is about the third of your row back, right next to the window. I know where it was. That's where my will give in to God's will for salvation. And when you'll be happy serving him, it's when your will gives in his will for your life. And it may be just simple. It might be a, a teaspoonful of honey in a lifetime. But if that's what God wants, amen. amen. But let's go through justification. Romans 5, 1 says, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That justification just means acquit, no evidence, innocent. I'm justified. Amen. Somebody says, justified and never sin. I'm innocent. I, I used to go to work in prisons, and I thought... I've not met too many guilty people in prisons even. I mean, if you talk to them, a few I have, but those are the only ones you could help when they realize they're, they're guilty. We was in a prison one time, and there's a big old, big old fella. And Brother Ed Blue preached over the intercom. Brother Ed Blue went by and shook hands. And that old fella said, uh, you the priest was on the intercom a while ago? And he said, yes, sir. He said, do you reckon God could save an old sorry, low-down sinner like me? Brother, they said, you're the only man I met the day that he could save. Amen. Because he realized what he was. But that day as an 11-year-old boy, I realized I was a sinner. And I'd heard that. I'd been raised right. But God, the Holy Ghost, convicted me of my sin. I didn't know nothing about justification. I didn't even really know what it meant. I'd heard about the grace of God or redemption or Propitiation, I didn't know either. I couldn't even say those words. But God saved me. And I found out later that I was innocent. After I'd heard the word a while, I found out what these words meant. It's an act of free grace by while God pardons the sinner and accepts him as righteous on account of the atonement, on account of the atonement of Jesus Christ. I had no idea. Boy, I've got a whole lot more than I knew I had. When I got saved. Amen. Brother Gary, I just didn't want to die and go to hell. Yes. I don't know anybody that got saved this got saved because they didn't want to go to hell. <laughs> oh, isn't it wonderful when you get in God's word and find out what you really have got? Amen. Amen. I, I was talking to Bernice last week and we talked quite a bit. She told the doctor the day before yesterday, she said, I want you to get me out of here so I can go back to church. That was her desire. <clears throat> oh, she'll get better one way or the other. Amen. Yes, Amen. He said, well, she may go on. Well, she'll be better. Amen. Uh, my mother got better one night. My daddy got better one night. I was standing by their bedside, both of them, when it got better. I mean, real well. No more heartaches, no more pain, no more sorrow. Maybe that don't mean nothing to you. Amen. I got a sister that got better right quick. 
went on with the Lord. What a time we're going to have Amen. when we get home. I get to see Mama too. <laughs> I still call every time I miss it. I call Mama too, and everybody knows what I'm talking about around my house. Uh, talking about Darcy's mother. But I'll get to see her again one of these days. Amen. Amen. I heard a song the other day. I wonder what they're doing now. I wonder what they're doing in heaven. Ah, one of these days I'll know. Then there's grace. It's undue with special honor. In due with special honor. Make accepted. Take care of it. Amen. <coughs> the joy he designs for the precipitant. Amen. Precipitant. He, he, Psalms 1, 8, uh, 18, 19b said, He delivered me because he delighted in me. Amen. You know what delighted Amen. means? In just old mountain language, thrilled. Yeah. I believe when God thinks of us, he's thrilled. Because <coughs> I'm one of his young ones. I really believe that. But the Bible says, For our grace are you saved through faith, and not in yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works. I know some people right now is trying to work their way into heaven. <coughs> it will come up short. You can't do enough. How, how, how do you know when you've done enough? How do you know when you've done enough to get into heaven? You might got a good answer. You don't. I know people probably die and go to hell. Good people. Doing good works. <clears throat> but that's all, they, their reward is now. Yeah. And you say, well, I know somebody don't do much, but they're saved. Well, they'll be there. Might not have a whole lot of rewards, but <coughs> they'll be there. Then redemption. Titus 2.14, the Bible says, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. That word zealous just means to seek or desire eagerly. Amen. Amen. Zealous of good work. To rescue and deliver from the bondage of sin, the penalty of God's violation of law. To be purchased from the slave market of sin, totally set free, never to be sold again. I was on a slave market. God outbid everybody. <laughs> I'll never be on a sin market again. Never. Never. I lived a million years, I'd still be saved. Amen. So are you sure you're saved? I'm sure I'm saved. And you know how I found out I was saved? By getting into God's Word. Amen. Amen. My uncle, I was telling Gary about it, died oh, a couple of years ago. And I talked to him in the hospital and I said, Oh, Carol, are you saved? <clears throat> now, I've heard people tell me he was such a good man, he had to be saved. And he said, no, I ain't going to lie to you. I'm not saved. But I went to see him a day before he died. And we gardened a little bit, and we groundhog hunted a little bit, and possum hunted, and whatever, you know, for a while. And we got quiet for a minute. And I heard a racket, and I looked up in tears. I'd never seen Carol Whittemore cry. Never seen no emotion out of him at all. Now, he was a jolly fella, but never seen him sad. Never seen him, you know, cry. Nothing. A tear just rolling off his cheek. And he's a sobbing. He said, Dink, I got saved. <laughs> now, it wouldn't have made no difference whether he told me or not as far as his salvation. But it sure did help my day. <clears throat> I was worried about it. But I'm glad. And I went back the next morning to see him. And he'd pulled out that night. Poor Brother Gary, you'll never know. Amen. How many times I thank God for let he didn't have to let me know that. And it would have made a bit of difference. He's still being just as saved. But it sure helped me to know. I like people tell me they're saved. Amen. I know it's not all in emotion. I know a lot of people get emotional and that's all it is. But if it's real. I spirit bear witness for me that day that he got saved. Amen. Because I know him. Amen. I knew him. For he's 85 year old when he got saved. But he had died and went to hell before he told you he was saved if he wasn't. He's just that honest. My brother said a lot of times, I wish I could swap my life for his life as far as the morals. He had higher standards than most quote unquote saved people I know <clears throat> in his life. Honest. 
very high standards, more than most church people I know, but he wasn't saved. But he did get saved. He got saved uh, six, eight months a year before that, but he had, he told other people, but I hadn't had a chance to sit down with him. Boy, I'm thankful, Doris, that I got to talk to Carol Amen. before he died. Amen. Then there's forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7. And whom we have redemption through the blood that will give us our sins according to the riches of his grace. It means they're erased from the memory, completely canceled, wiped the slate clean, the pardon of an offender by which he is considered treated as not guilty. Brother Gary, I didn't know all this before I got saved. I didn't know what I was getting into, but I'm glad I got into it. Amen. Now it's propitiation. Man, what a word. John... 1 John 2, 2, and he is a propitiation for our sins, not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. What did Jesus say? God so loved the world, if they just accept it. This just means atonement. Remove from the record, cancel. The Hebrews 9, 22 says, there's no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. There's no remission. No forgiveness unless there's shedding of blood. Now, I know people like and if you put works into it, that's where people get into legalism. That's all legalism is, when they start adding to and taking away from the simple plan of salvation. Start adding works to keep it. Start adding works to get it. Amen. I didn't work my way in, and I can't work my way out. I can't fall out. When I get in his hand, you can't fall out. Amen. I, I believe that. I know a fellow right now that thinks he was saved and he's young, but the way he was taught that you could lose it, he thinks he's lost it. And he may be saved. I don't know. The way he talks, I wouldn't doubt if he's not saved because he's, he's convinced that he got saved when he's 12 years old, but he lost it. But that's all he's ever heard from the time he's, his granny raised him and from that time went into foster home after foster home after foster home. You don't know what he was taught. Never was disciplined, discipled at all. And we fail. A young person gets saved. If we don't disciple them right, and they end up in trouble. Just as saved as I am, they just never have been grounded like I, I was privileged to be taught. Uh, Bernice told me the other day, said, I think there's no telling where I'd be if we hadn't been taught the way we were taught. <clears throat> Not for salvation, just everyday life. Amen. An imputation. Romans 4 8. And Laman. But we'll go. Uh, Paul said, If we if he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee ought, put that on mine account. Amen. Did, did he not say that? No Onesimus? And uh, in Romans it says, Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. You know the devil goes all the time accusing us of all kind of stuff. And you know what Jesus says? Let's put it on my account. Yeah. Well, i got a good account. Amen. Now my bank account's not the greatest in this world, but I ain't going to need it long anyway. Amen. Amen. I know Dr. Seitler, he... He gives 75% of what he got, they got at the church, the missions, and run the church off 25%. Ah, uh, you can't do that. Yeah, you can. Amen. He did it. It can be done. But now you can't put thousands and thousands. These churches right now got millions in the bank. Oh, what are they going to do with it when the rapture takes place? Somebody's going to have to give an account to God for all the money they've laid. I'm talking about, I'm not saying not. Save up money for emergency. I'm not saying that. But if God's getting dear in your heart to give the missions, I'd just give it to him. Amen. He can multiply that, take care of you. I can name you things that God has supplied my need. I was in the hospital one time. Got out and they sent me a bill for $47,000. <coughs> Whoa. That may not mean much money to you, but that's a whole lot. This old boy, he had a Three kids, I had a lot of money. <coughs> God paid all of it, but about eight hundred dollars. I didn't cost me a dime. Amen. Amen. I believe it cost me eight hundred dollars for the hospital bill, brother Gary. Amen. Somebody told me later, said that's your mission money you've been getting. That's your faith promise money. I hadn't even thought about it. 
I just knew God had took care of him. Amen. Now, I don't want to go back to the hospital and get nothing to see if he'd do it again. Amen. Yeah. But if, he, if I do, he will do it again. Amen. He'll take care of his own. You will not stand before God and say, God, you didn't take care of my need. He'll take care of what we need. It might not be financially. It may be physically. Amen. It may be. I, my old heart flip-flops every once in a while. But that's all right. It still beats. <laughs> I went to sleep last night. When I woke up, my heart's still beating. I didn't do a thing. I didn't say, now, heart, you beat while I'm asleep. I've done that for about 66 years now, and I ain't never told it to beat. Sometimes I wonder if he's going to, but that's natural. <laughs> but God tells our heart to beat. And when he tells it to stop, it'll stop. Amen. I believe that. You say, you want to die now? No. I know. I want to live as much as next man. But now, there's some people I just say, be dead. Is what's shaping. I see them all the time in the hospital. I hope God takes me on. He might not. I may have to go through that stuff. I don't know. But his grace will be there. Amen. I receive him. Jesus said, I'll receive him as myself. What a, what a wonderful thing. And then sanctification. I guess what most people don't like is that God, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. And that's all so sanctification is. State of purity, separation to God, not from God, to God. It's a separation from this old worldly goods, this old worldly atmosphere, to separate to God. Now most, now I'm a Baptist, from right here to the bottom of my foot. I'm a Baptist. That's the way, that's the way I believe. Why do I, why do you, I believe in Baptists? Because I believe they stand closest to the book than anybody I know of. If anybody else comes along, I might join them, but right now I'm a Baptist, and I'll probably stay that till the day I die. But I don't like some of the things God's told me to take on and give up. This, this old flesh ain't going to get happy to give up some things. I've had to give up things that I didn't like to give up, take on some things. This old flesh is lazy. You know the hardest thing you'll ever do is pray. It's hard work. Oh, I just pray and get into glory all the time. I don't believe it. I've been saved 40 something, near to 50 something year now. Praying's hard work sometimes. Now, sometimes you do pray, and you get in the throne room, and it doesn't even like you ain't prayed in no time, and you've been there a while. But it ain't like that every time. I, maybe you're closer than I am. Sometimes it's just plain old hard work. Studying? I don't like to read. I don't like to study. I used to read books and read all night some old junk before I got right. But you know when you start reading God's Word, the devil will fight you. My old body, my old flesh don't like it. So I have to work at it. Amen. But it's a separation to God. And it must be pursued by the believer. Now, I, I don't have no watch, so I brought my calendar with me, so everybody quit looking at the watches. I've got my time right here. I brought my calendar with me. I don't have no watch. So, uh, <clears throat> And then dedication must be pursued, pursued, pursued. That means every day. What did Apostle Paul say? I die daily. That means evidently if Apostle Paul had to die daily, then I'm pretty sure Brother Whittemore has to die daily. Amen. The result of obedience to God's word and following Christ's example. Amen. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Spiritually purified. Amen. That's what it means. Then glorification. I didn't know all these words. I didn't know I got all this. The state of blessedness into which believers are to enter through the being brought into the likeness of Christ. The character and ways of God is exhibited through Christ and through believers. Amen. It's like being intoxicated, God-like. I heard a preacher preach one time some of the characteristics of a drunk ought to be in us. He had about several points. We don't care. Amen. We shouldn't care. They're not ashamed. 
A lot of things. Had to depend on somebody else to take care of them. Amen. I'm not saying y'all get drunk just see how it fell, but uh, they don't care. They don't care what they say, where they say it, who they say it to. It don't matter because they're not under the influence of themselves. We ought to be under the influence of God where we have enough spiritual holiness or boldness to speak up and tell others about Jesus. Amen. Romans 8.30, the last part of that verse, and said, whom he had called, he also justified, whom he had justified, he also glorified. Amen. Then glorification continued here, Ephesians 2, 6, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I used to read that and I said, he made us to, made us to sit, like maybe in the future. This said he made us sit now. I'm sitting in Christ in heavenly places right now. When I got saved, I was sitting in Christ right then and still sitting there. Amen. Do I always act like it? No. Do you always act like it? I'll let you answer that. But I know how I am. But people all see the way I act daily and say, there's something different about him. I can't say they've always been that way, but that's the way that it should be in our lives as saved people. And a believer is being saved from the penalty of sin, Ephesians 2, 5, 8 through 10. The believer is being saved from the power of sin, Galatians 2, 20. The believer is being saved from the presence of sin. One of these days, I'll be so glad. So glad. When I don't have to fight this old flesh and the devil and the world. And I blame it on the devil most of the time. A lot of it's my own doings. This old flesh gets me in trouble. And Paul said, I'm a debtor. Romans 1, 14. And a debtor means obligation, unpaid debt. We owe. Amen. It's entitled, worthy of justifiable expectation. <coughs> it's a privilege. Is it to me? It's what ought to be. It's what's the right thing to be. And in Athens, an insolvent debtor, which just means can't pay, became a slave to the creditor. I am a debtor. Now, from my viewpoint, I owe God everything. But from God's looking on me, I don't owe him anything. Do you, does that make sense? How much did he charge you for your salvation? How much you paid? How much, many of you paid for salvation? How many of you men got your wife a present for Christmas? Now, if you just just think about that, don't raise your hand. Some of you might get embarrassed. But how much did you charge her for it when you give it to her? Wouldn't have been a gift, would it? Brother Gary, if I give you something and charge you for it, it ain't a gift. You paid for it. I got a gift of salvation, eternal life. And I didn't have to pay a thing. Now, I'm a debtor. Do you know who I owe? I owe my neighbor. I owe that lost person down the street. I owe that people I meet on the street. I owe the lost people of this world. I'm a debt to them. <coughs> Brother Tommy Morrow wants me to pray for his daddy. I owe that man. I owe it to him to pray for him and tell him about Jesus if I get a chance. Amen. But God didn't charge me anything for own, to own everything. Do you really get in your what? I didn't know I got all these things when I got saved. I just didn't want to die and go to hell. And I ain't going. Amen. I cannot go. I've had people tell me to go. I, I'm serious. If you ain't never had, you ain't never done no witnessing much. If you ain't had somebody tell you that, you know what you do? You don't get mad. You say I can't. Impossible, I can't. I mean, I, you know, disappoint them. <laughs> Put it back in their laps. I can't. And I can't. I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled. But that's not all it is to salvation. That just, it's not just get out of hell free as the saying goes. All these things I got when I got saved. And I've learned that mostly since I've been saved. How many of you? If you'd have seen all you was going to go through from the time you got saved to now, 
scared you to death. Amen. If you'd seen all the trials and everything, you'd have been dis so discouraged you wouldn't have went nowhere. But when you look back on it, you see how God brought you through it. Grace, grace, grace. I want to encourage you this morning. We owe a debt. And it's the lost people mostly. We owe, we owe, we owe people to get the gospel out. Put out tracks. Put out tracks. I put out four or five this morning up at the hospital. Every time I go on the elevator, I put a track for somebody can find. He said, well, they just throw it in the trash. That's not up to me. I leave them on tables. I leave them everywhere else, everywhere I go. Now, it's not bragging on me. That's just getting the gospel out. Get the gospel out one way or another. <clears throat> I, I've been reading a book I found in a yard sale. It was that big sale. About testimonies of <laughs> saved people and testimonies of lost people that died. And I've been reading the saved people, the ones that were burned at the stake. Some of the people in Scotland, the people that were hung and tortured. Oh, what test. I mean, not just people have been saved 150 years. They want a 20-year-old man. They put him in the foot crusher, as they call it. I think that's what they call it. And they crushed his feet very slowly because he wouldn't recant, because he wouldn't deny Christ. 20 years old. He couldn't even walk to the scaffold. The guards had to pick him up carry him up to be hung but he never give up his he never recanted and then we think we really being persecuted don't we when somebody shuns us or makes fun of us I cry and moan and groan oh me you know it may come to the day we end up the same thing in America oh it never will come to that they working at it pretty good they're working on persecution right now. If you knew what was going on in the underworld as far as against Christianity, you probably would want to quit. Yeah. Amen. I'm talking about right here in America. And I'm a veteran. Amen. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Not that I'm even giving. I'm, I'm proud of it. I wear me a, a veteran's hat. Amen. I'm proud of America. But she's sliding downhill fast. But we're going to get one toot on that horn and we'll be out of here. I'm waiting for a toot. That flute helped me a whole lot. I just toot my flute. And, and I'm waiting on that one, one, one note. <coughs> no Gabriel put one note. We'll be out of here. That man, and I, maybe today, I wish it could happen today. I'd like, I like to go see Mother and Daddy and Stokes and Mama too. I, I want to see him again. I miss my daddy more than the last month, and I missed him since he, he died in 03. And I've missed him more in the last month and a half since he'd been gone. I miss him. I miss mother. But I don't know why. Just lately I've missed dad. Maybe, I go, maybe I'm getting worried, ready to see him again. Hey, man. I sure would love to see him. But I want to see Jesus. I heard a song the other day say, I want to see Jesus. And thank him for saving me and then tell him all my troubles. Amen. That makes sense, brother? Amen. Next time he sees Jesus, if he's still got problems, he's at the great white throne. He ain't, the, he ain't in the right judgment. If I got problems when I see Jesus, I'm at the great white throne with the lost people. That song didn't make no sense to me, but <clears throat> had a nice tune to it. And I said, Did I hear right? So I kept playing it. Sure enough, that's what they said. I'm going to tell him all my troubles when I see him. I ain't going to have no troubles when I see Jesus. My troubles will be gone. And yours will too. That was 31.45 seconds. I timed it with my calendar. Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Amen. We got saved and we got something, didn't we? Amen.